on this week's episode Detective Pikachu, we choose you Nintendo wins their piracy suit and we discuss the latest entry into the wizarding world Welcome to the Cynical Optimists, where our Patronus is a clapperboard that eats Dementors like Pac-Man. I'm Phil. <laughs> and I'm Nick. <laughs> and welcome to a, another episode where we'll be going over the film, TV and gaming news of the week. And then we'll be going on to discuss the latest in the Wizarding World cinematic universe. Can you believe we're saying that? I know. Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. So actually... I'm going to start with a bit of housekeeping, because this is our third episode of the new run, but it is the first, well, the first week we weren't sure if we are going to be able to do it in time, and last week was the quiz, so it didn't really fit, but we have a new opening theme. Yay. Huzzah! So, I want to thank my friend Joe for his good work on that, and dealing with two clients who knew what they wanted, but know nothing about music, <laughs> so I couldn't describe it. So very true. And as you'll see, like as was alluded to in our first episode, we've made a few changes to the format. And the big one is it is now on SoundCloud, so you can listen to just the audio on the go a bit easier, or you can download it if you want. So you don't have to keep your phone open while you're trying to listen to it on YouTube. Exactly. It's going to use up unnecessary amounts of your data. Yay. Uh, and as of today, keep uh, keep following the Twitter for more updates but we have submitted to iTunes, so might be that it's super convenient. Yeah. Uh, f- but we'll have to see how that goes. You but can even get updates had- for us, potentially. Yeah. You'll though, never so miss an episode. Never miss an episode, exactly. So yeah, I just wanted to get my house, house, uh, house, you know. House cleaning? My updates, my house cleaning, my updates out the way at the beginning to be like yes check us out on soundcloud give us a follow and possibly subscribe on itunes in a few days keep following the twitter but anyway how have you been nick i've been very well thank you how are you i'm good i'm good i'm ready to uh, get into some news there's some stories that like as usual there was a story that broke as soon as we finished recording two weeks ago yes but this and i was like this time though it it doesn't matter because we didn't any news last week yeah, no, I was like, well, that story, we're just it, not going to talk about it at all. <laughs> but it's fine, because there's been plenty of stories, and there's been actually quite a few games released, like Pokemon Let's Go is now out. So, yes, it is. you know, and the new Spyro trilogy and Fallout 76, so none of them, I don't think, feature that heavily in my news this week, but... They're there. Yeah, they're they all just, out. They're uh, all out. Um... Did you see uh, the news trailer for Smash? Sorry, I know this is getting ahead, but... <laughs> He's so eager it's to not jump a... into gaming news. We're bypassing but, film and TV news. There isn't any. Um, That's not true. But it's, bec- it's because I've got more pressing things to talk about in gaming news. <laughs> and this is just basically me saying, did you see the memes? No, I didn't see the memes. About what, sorry? It's the Smash Bros trailer. Because it is... Uh, it's like the billboard comes to life and all the characters are fighting, but because it's just sound effects, yeah, everyone has had a field day just adding different music to it. <laughs> you should look it up; it's it's good. That sounds pretty good. Welcome to film and TV news. Uh, I'm going to start with TV. Well, not technically television anymore, is it? But uh, Disney D- Disney streaming service. You know they've given it a name now. This was a couple of yeah. weeks ago. We, we're gonna have Disney Plus. That's the uh, that's what it's gonna be. Right. Yeah. Um, the Loki series has been confirmed with Tom Hiddleston, although that was rumored anyway, so we knew about that. 
Uh, we knew about The Mandalorian, but now we know it's going to star uh, Gina Carano, who played um, Angel Dust in the first Deadpool movie, and it's going to have Pedro Pascal as, as The Mandalorian in it as well. All sounds pretty pretty magnificent. We've also got a Cassian Andor TV series uh, with Diego Luna returning to the role from Rogue One. You excited for that? Yeah. No, it's going to be good because he was a well, he played a good role in Rogue One, so I'm interested to see like what they come up with for yeah, it. I thought that was definitely one of the uh, better characters in that film, and I liked. Yeah, I liked Rogue One as well. I thought that was like a really cool, like it. It felt like it was expanding the universe a bit, so I'm, I'm excited to see a bit more about the background of of that character, assuming it is a prequel. I mean, <laughs> I'd be surprised if it was a sequel. <laughs> yeah, so would but, I. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it'd be a bit of a stretch in the first episode, but I've seen bigger stretches, so... Exactly. <laughs> um, but yes, we... Some Game of Thrones news? You're not really into it, are you? No, it's one of the, It's on my list. But as you know, that's what I say about literally every show. <laughs> well, if it it's is on, on my list, list, you might want to catch up on it between now and April next year. Because that's when, it's been confirmed, that's when season 8 will be airing the final season of Game of Thrones. I kind of wish it was coming a bit earlier in the year though, so that they could use the tagline, Winter is coming, coming in winter. <laughs> Actually, that, does well, sound, yeah, that so... sounds weird reading it aloud. It sounded <laughs> fine on my notes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like what would have been the best marketing blunder. <laughs> I kind of hope that had happened. <laughs> um, but speaking of winter, uh, <laughs> Doctor Who will not be getting a Christmas Day episode for the first time since 2004. Um, instead, the special will air on New Year's Day 2019. What do you think? Yeah, yeah so the first I heard of that story, I thought there just wasn't going to be an episode, and I was like... Well, I suppose the series would have, like, just ended, so... Yeah. But then I was like, oh, it's going to be New Year's Day instead. And I was like, oh, okay. Sure. New New Year's Day, like... I always I always, always watch the Doctor Who Christmas specials, but it's got a lot more to compete with on Christmas Day than New Year's Day. Not to sound like the showrunner was being defeatist. Yeah. But, you know, everyone's nice and hungover on New Year's Day, just... <laughs> Lying back on their sofa, they'll be they'll be happy to watch. Well, that's why day. they that's why they pick the uh, Sunday night slot as well for the most of the season, isn't it? It's uh, it's just a bit more. It's... You're not out or anything on. You're not you're not getting pissed on the Sunday night as opposed to the Saturday night kind of thing. It's Doctor Who going after that hungover demographic. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's doing so well. <laughs> it's vital if you want your TV show to succeed. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Are you up to date? Uh, yes, I I think there's an episode, uh, just to, you know, date this, we're recording on Sunday night, I yeah. think an episode has just aired, I haven't yeah. seen that one. No, me neither. Um, but I caught up on last week's Today and I thought it was quite good. Yeah. I, th I think this has been a very strong season. It has, I think the writing's been really good, um, characters have just better developed than before. Okay, I hate to say this, do we think it's a little bit less, I mean, underindulgent? In what respect? Okay, so obviously I was burnt out of like Daleks and everything by the end of the Moffat era, but like, I don't know, there's not like the huge amount of lore going on in this series. No, it's been stripped, it's basically it's stripped it down to the basic mechanics and is yeah. just kind of build building up again. As like, as the the inner child in me is, is kind of shouting for it to be a bit more indulgent, like explosions and Daleks and stuff, I don't know. Yeah, no, I find it interesting because even since 2005 when Russell T brought it back, that series was, in in quote marks, back to basics because all the stories took place on or surrounding Earth. Yeah. Then there was one of the Stephen Moffat series where he was like, oh, we'll bring it back to basics, and that just didn't happen, I guess. <laughs> I, can't, well, I don't thing, remember. This, is the, furthest, he, this he, is the furthest on in a series I think we've gone without... Any a returning enemy. Yeah, exactly. I think it's kind of good because it means that it's it is like showing what it can do. Yeah, it's, it's not, not it's not necessarily a bad thing, I, and it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be returning villains. 
but like yeah. just, maybe something a bit like a bit high concept or a bit out there I, I don't know I like the alien in the the first episode yes. with all the the weird teeth in his face I really like that as well that was cool um, um I think at least twice now they've done the thing of like the monster wasn't really a monster it was just kind of there yeah exactly like, yeah and uh, it be we've had two, yeah I see we've what you mean. historical episodes as well which I mean it's it's great like it's kind of one of the key ideas of Doctor Who isn't it is um education mm. um especially as this is less about like British history necessarily um which I think is really cool as well I don't yeah it's a, I really like what they're doing but like I I quite like to see a little bit of indulgence here and there and obviously a they've done more... obviously they've done spaceships and stuff already but like that's so a bit more of the sci-fi yes. bit of it. Yeah, I guess. I think this series has been using the episodes in the past a lot more effectively than some of the past ones, though. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, like oh, who remembers Let's Kill Hitler? <laughs> what, a, what a good education on World War Two that was. I learned so much um, <laughs> about the context of the war and the Nazis. <laughs> it was... <laughs> But even, like, Russell T episodes such as the one with Shakespeare was, like, it was interesting seeing Shakespeare. Yeah. But at the same time, it ended up being a plot about, like, witches and everything just felt a little, like, almost, like, cleaned up history, like a very pleasant yeah. show of events. Whereas I like how this is, like, actually, no, things were pretty shit. Yeah. Well, you remember Vincent and the Doctor? Hmm. That was a good one. That was a good episode, yeah. That was yeah. a very strong one. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sounding ungrateful here for because all, I always wanted just like better developed characters from the Moffat series, and now I'm like, oh, but I kind of want some more explosions and stuff. <laughs> Basically, yeah, but you're... I'm a typical sci-fi franchise fan who they yeah. can never get it right with. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um. Avengers 4, moving on to film news uh, Joe Russo has said it's pro- it's at the moment looking to be about three hours long I mean that's probably going to change before it's released, but you never know hmm. it might it might come in as the like longest superhero movie of all time <laughs> yeah and I mean if there was one, if there was a film that was going to take that title, it sounds like this one might be an appropriate one to oh, yeah. get it. I'm sure it would deserve it. Especially as you're so long into the franchise and you've got so many plot elements that you've set up. Yeah, it so... Would, it would definitely... Uh, I don't think it would necessarily impact hurt the film if you made it that long. Well, like you say, I would not be surprised if some stuff gets left on the cutting room floor <laughs> when it comes to it, but if there was a film that was going to be no, we need this runtime, it's probably going to be this film. Yeah. But anyway, I'm I'm over Avengers, Phil. I don't want to hear about the Avengers. No? No, because now it's all about Detective Pikachu. <laughs> you saw the trailer? Of course. I have wanted to see a live-action Pokemon movie since I was born. I'm <laughs> so buzzed for this. And it looks really good. I thought, I thought all the Pokemon looked great. You see Charizard snapping his teeth. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was like... It's like something you did, wouldn't think would be approved by like a film studio because it's just a bit <laughs> weird and nuts. Yeah, but it has. So yeah, it'll probably probably do well. Well, that's the thing as well. Is that like people like it's kind of the fact that it's a bit crazy and it's Ryan Reynolds and he's Deadpool. It's like everyone's kind of going a bit mad for it on social media. They're being like, "Oh my god, it's it's Pikachu. It's live action, but it's it's voiced by Deadpool." <laughs> it's. I think it's cool. It looks great. Great concept for a film. Have you seen the version of the trailer where they do actually use... Because obviously there was a big push for it to be Danny DeVito. <laughs> Have you seen the version of the trailer using lines from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? I the... haven't, no. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, I might need to watch that. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's using obviously all his like, most out there like rudest lines. Yeah. But it's just so <laughs> funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm properly hyped for this movie. No, I'm really looking forward to it. I believe it comes out when we're doing our our summer wave of podcasts, so 
We'll definitely be seeing it and definitely be talking about it on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm hailing it now as the best film of next year. Just How about just like best film of all time? It's just going to win all the awards. It could be. You know, The Dark Knight has been one of my top spots for a long time, but this could this could take its crown. <laughs> <laughs> just the sentence of The Dark Knight was my famous uh, was my favorite film, but then Detective Pikachu came out, <laughs> changed the game. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next summer we're also getting Toy Story 4 have you seen these little teasers they've released for these I've seen like the the main one I saw a bit of one of the side ones you saw the the one with Forky yeah and that seemed really weird to me and I was like hmm (coughs) it was what what are they doing yeah it didn't yeah I mean who knows who knows what the plot of this is going to be they've released like barely any details but uh, Forky is voiced by uh, Arrested Development's Tony Hale. You know he plays uh, Buster in oh, Arrested Development. Oh, okay. So that's... there's some talent coming into this film. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I find it very difficult um, to not be a bit cynical about it. Eh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> because number three was just such a good mm. ender. It just solved it you know just closed off the trilogy you don't really need this one <laughs> yeah I'm afraid it's gonna like just have to uh, reopen old plot threads in order just to tack a little bit on or something like that do you reckon they'll but, kill, kill a major character I'm not even sure how toys die so <laughs> and it's not it's not one of my burning questions going into Toy Story Four. I'm gonna burning, be honest. Burning. That's how you kill them. It's gonna. They're gonna go back into the sauna. The um, sauna. Back into the. Uh, what's it called? Furnace from Toy Story Three. God, it's it's gonna be. It's gonna be a deeply disturbing f- uh, scene <laughs> in a children's film, as we watch Buzz Lightyear melt. <laughs> Deeply disturbing themes in a children's film is a theme we're going to come back to later. <laughs> Toy um, Story 4 is the gritty reboot. <laughs> um, we also met Ducky and Bunny, played by the comedian duo Key and Peel. Um, that, that was in the second little teaser clip they, re- they released. Seems pretty fun. Seems quite fun. Yeah, I watched that one till about halfway through and then I just... I'm going to be honest, they were just kind of talking about Toy Story and I was like... Yeah, nah. yeah, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't amazing. Obviously, they're just kind of, they're realizing that they should start just ramping up the marketing now, so that people are aware of that there's a fourth film when it comes to June. Because like, yeah, but you, you, like, because for a while it was just like, oh, apparently there's a Toy Story four happening. Whereas now, it's shared and it's gone viral, and now people at least know that it's in the, it's in the public conscious kind of thing. And that's the thing, and it hasn't given away anything. It's just got everyone talking about it, which is obviously just good marketing. Well, exactly. Sure... We're, we're talking about it. I don't even have anything to say about it. I just felt obliged to mention it. Well, that's the thing. We'll probably get a full trailer March time, and then yeah. another trailer closer to release. Yeah. Because to be honest, we've not seen anything about Avengers Four, and that comes out sooner. Yeah, no, that's true. But that's that's done intentionally, I believe. Yeah, no, I I agree. It's definitely done intentionally because everyone knows it's coming out. Yeah. Well, do you remember Justice League? We had a trailer like two years before it came out. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> at least people. <laughs> well, I was going to say that didn't. I was going to say that at least that put it in the public conscious, but nobody watched it. I'm pretty sure Venom has just outgrossed it, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. And oh, Venom wow. sucked. Yeah, no, I. <laughs> I was gonna go see it, but then you I think you did this message me like don't bother. <laughs> like yeah. just don't. No, it's really not <laughs> worth it. Um Yeah, you know the this other jungle book adaptation that we've been talking about on the podcast for a, a little bit, Andy Circus is, is directing. Yes. And it's like a Warner Brothers grittier version. Isn't this the one that's just called Mowgli or something like that? Well, actually, you say that now it's just been renamed because they wanted it to sound more original um, Because in, in case people got confused with the Disney version. So are you ready for this 100% more original title? Uh, is it called The Jungle Film? No, it's called Mowgli, colon, Legend of the Jungle. 
So to differentiate it from the Jungle Book, <laughs> they took a the title. They, they, yeah, they've added the word jungle back into the title. <laughs> Legend oh, of the that, Jungle. That's such a generic name. Maybe Warner Brothers are setting this one up for five films as well. <laughs> I oh yeah oh yeah we spoke about Avatar two weeks ago didn't we? Yeah, I'm sick of fucking subtitles in film names. Like oh. Mowgli was a good title by itself. Yeah, yeah I thought so. But and then, now the I don't know it's, the subtitle is just so generic. Yeah. Well, don't worry because if you weren't thinking about going to see it in the cinema, you can now not think about seeing it on Netflix because they've signed a deal with. Netflix it will stream at literally the same time it hits theatres I think it's like next week actually that is a uh, that is definitely a move of confidence that is <laughs> definitely a people will pay to see my movie move <laughs> not a no one's going to pay to see it yeah Netflix uh, are at the so... door they've got a pile of cash in their hands yeah why not just give it to them <laughs> They've got like fifty pounds, and we think that's more than we're going to box office. So we're yeah. taking this deal. You know, I want to. I want to make the deal with the banker now. <laughs> <laughs> so now Mowgli is releasing in like a week or two. You can go from not watching it in theaters to not watching it online. It's up to you. I look forward to not watching it. <laughs> Circus is a talented guy. I'm sure it'll be all right. That's the thing. It's got decent names behind it, so I don't think it's going to be terrible. It's just going to be following up the jungle book which was really good <laughs> yeah it's going to be the second one to hit you know to come out which you see quite a lot of and yeah. and some take cases the second one ends up eclipsing the first one like i'm thinking more on the game space uh like fortnite has basically eclipsed pubg right yeah but at the same time a game called battleborn came out a few weeks after overwatch uh and no one talks about Battleborn anymore. <laughs> I haven't even heard of Battleborn. Exactly, because <laughs> Overwatch came, did a great job, and that was it. So um, we'll see. Yeah, see how it goes. Um, I've I've absolutely raced through my news. I had quite a lot there to cover, but I feel like we've we're pretty much up to date. But I'm going to throw you under the bus just before gaming news, Phil, and I'm going to bring the tone right down because, of course, we all know. Stan Lee has passed away, age 95. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> this. <laughs> I mean, I mean amazing. That's a... <laughs> no, that, as in ridiculous, and is like he had such an amazing life, and like right up until the end, he was yeah. doing stuff. He was still working on characters just before he died. Genuine, yeah, genuine legend, which we don't often say often. Um, yeah, no, he, pr- he probably like... created everyone's listening. Your favorite superhero. Um, he, he stood up for like minorities and comics. He, he adored his fans. Best cameos in existence. You know the guy. Um, a, a massive on behalf of Synops. Excelsior. R.I.P. Excelsior, yeah. Absolute legend. Um, yeah, so good luck. Bring the tone back up for, for your next segment. So the first gaming story I wanted to talk about this week is piracy, and sadly not the Sea of Thieves swashbuckling kind. To be precise, this is about a recent lawsuit over emulators and ROM distribution. If you aren't aware, an emulator is a piece of software designed to mimic or emulate a console and allows people to play otherwise unplayable games on different tech, Hmm. the most prominent being emulators which allow old console games to be played on a PC. A ROM, meanwhile, stands for read-only memory, a specific type of memory, which, whilst it has a range of applications, one of it, one of them is that it can be manufactured to store software that can only be read on specific hardware, i.e. video game cartridges. Mm-hmm. A digital ROM of a game is needed in conjunction with an emulator in order to emulate games. Video game companies, naturally, are against this as it means their IP gets shared around the web and it enables piracy of old games, even if said games are no longer in active production or available through legal means. Mm -hmm. So whilst many sites have been shut down over this over the years, this week's story is a bit different. So as reported on Torrent Freak amongst many other sites, Nintendo's just reached a settlement with a ROM website called loveroms.com after suing them over copyright and trademark infringement 
The result is that the owners of Love ROMs have to pay Nintendo to the tune of twelve million dollars. What? So whilst the reality is that the couple might not have to pay this much, there is precedent of there being other similar copyright lawsuits in the film industry where the you know the the number on the court case has been like massive and they've not paid that much back. It's an amount big enough to send a message to all still existing ROM sites. Yeah. That you know this could be you. So, what I'm not trying to do is to try and imply that distributing ROMs is not piracy, as it as it is. However, I feel like a lawsuit against one of the sites to make an example of them is kind of a bad way to go about it. Yeah. So I've, I appreciate the law is strict around these areas and that company need to protect Well, this IP. is this is the thing, like, I can only... You know, you know I can only sort of bring my knowledge of, like, the film and TV industry into... Into into your into your gaming knowledge half the time, but like, do you remember those adverts that were like you wouldn't steal a handbag, you wouldn't steal a car? Yes, that are... that, that wasn't what stopped people streaming uh, or or like illegally downloading, um, pirating anything like that. That wasn't that that wasn't what stopped it. What stopped it was well, obviously it hasn't stopped it, but the 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 best thing they've done to prevent that, and the same in the music industry, is just release good services. <laughs> Yeah, so like, that's, like with with film and TV, yeah. it's just like nobody really torrents things anymore because like you got like Now TV and Netflix, which give you like good shows for like quite a low amount a month. And like in the gaming industry, obviously Nintendo, I guess, have started doing it with like their mini consoles with the HDMI and everything like that. But like they don't do all the games on that, do they? No, and this is this is kind of almost why I wanted to talk about it this week. Not so much because of the lawsuit, because kind of the law is a funny thing in that if Nintendo doesn't take down everyone, then it gives them a less, you know, less solid position to protect their IP in future. Yeah, it's one of those weird things about law. So I'm not contesting that they've got every right to obviously take down somebody that is distributing their IP illegally. Mm -hmm. But it just goes on to highlight, basically, as you've said, that there is no good service for archiving old games and gaming history, and I just think that's such a shame. Yeah. Because there are the mini consoles, which we discussed um, two weeks ago, Uh as obviously the PlayStation one's coming out. On the Wii and Wii U, there was the virtual console. Yeah. And... Now there is the NES service for Switch Online, which has a range of NES games. But the problem is that each of these have only ever been a handful of titles, and every time a new console comes out, basically the slate has been wiped, wiped clean for the next yeah. s- next thing. And that just... It means that, like, I bought, like, one or two NES games on my Wii U, but I can't... I now have to play them on an old console anyway, because I've got the Switch. Yeah. So it's it's not making them easily available like say Netflix or Amazon Prime or any of the other things we've been describing yeah and it's just a massive issue in games as a whole and whilst you know my big thing I come back to whenever I like think about it is that clearly it must not be as hard as game companies make it look to bring old games to new software yeah because on a PC, an emulator can just emulate any game. Like I don't know anything about like a, like a good architecture. Like, nearly ten years ago, I was playing Pokemon on an emulator on my Android phone. Like exactly. You like can, I don't. The technology is definitely there, but like thing is that was that was that's the thing is that you're causing a hassle there. Whereas you could actually you could make you could make the money. Like if Nin- if Nintendo were to release like. Pokemon Yellow on the App Store they could charge like I would pay like five quid for that (laughs) well it's not even that like well on the thing of App Store I do I do agree with Nintendo's kind of approach to it in that the stuff they're making into apps such as Pokemon Go Super Mario Run and there is an upcoming Mario Kart game Mm -hmm. is that they're only meant to be like bite sized versions of console experiences yeah, no, I get that, but but, but, but like, even the having a market is there, isn't it? But yeah, having a, say an app on the 
like a sub- an app that you had to subscribe to on the Switch. Yeah. That was basically just an emulator that had been designed for Switch hardware and just gave you access to streaming the ROMs. Mm-hmm. Which is something that can be done because, like, people do it when they're doing emulators. Yeah. The problem is when you give out... Well, the the thing is when you dish out those games one at a time, you then get to charge for each game. Mm-hmm. And part of me argues that those games shouldn't really be worth that much anymore, especially somewhere <laughs> like the smaller <laughs> titles. And arguably as well, you could make more money in the long term by... Take Netflix, for example. I think I pay £8 a month. Mm-hmm. And if it was eight pounds a month for like streaming video games, do that over the course of a few years, and I've probably paid more money than I would have to buy the handful of games that I'll probably play on that service anyway. Yeah, exactly. So I think it is like, well, see, the lawsuit was kind of, I guess, see, the lead in. The discussion is more about like how there really does need to be a way, a legal way, of playing old games and not just the big names like Super Mario Brothers for like the 10th time on the 10th console <laughs> no exactly and like like instead of noticing that the trend is there they're basically trying to snuff the trend out before it's kind of yeah and got anyway. the attempts by to be honest all console platform holders is usually uh, we'll do a few we'll do a few of the big names and then some of the third party ones will keep re-releasing like Final Fantasy VII has been getting released on Switch. It was previously released on Steam and PS4 and PS3, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like there's surely like a simpler, more universal way to like do this that would just, I mean, legally for like the IP behind games developed by different publishers, it would probably be a bit difficult. Yeah. But if Nintendo started a popular <laughs> site with just their first party IPs from their old games and you know the whole streaming idea other companies would be more than happy to play ball if it was successful they'd be like we want our old N64 <coughs> SNES NES games available as well and yeah so I think it's just there needs to be something more and obviously this isn't reporting news this is just me getting on my little soapbox and going I don't <laughs> like it <laughs> but hey that's, that's the thing is that the like news is. I like I mean, obviously, you're never going to sort of snuff out piracy altogether. But, like, why would you kind of... With, like, films, like, why would you go to the hassle of, like, watching, like, a shit download on your, like, computer screen and then, like, having to plug the computer screen into your HDMI and your TV when you can just literally just log on to, like, Google Play or or like iTunes or anything on, on your smart TV and just, like, it's there kind of waiting for you. Like, just just give people the convenience and people will pay a bit more for it. Yeah, no, it's... um, It is the exact thing of, like, why would you risk going on online to a dodgy site and potentially getting a virus and breaking your computer Yeah, when it's just on Netflix? Yeah, exactly. Um, although, actually, when I was doing research for this story, I found... Well, I found a story from 2016, which was purely for Australia, but it said that since the advent of Netflix and Amazon and all that, that piracy in Australia was at its lowest that it had ever been. Even before, However, even before computers? Well, I... You know, there's still, I guess... Well, before computers, there's still, like, disc... You know, those dodgy VHSs and stuff. But before electricity? <laughs> <laughs> Stop being pedantic. <laughs> uh, however, I found a contradicting report from this year by an organisation called MUSO, and for the life of me, I could not find out what that stands for, but they seem to do a lot of stuff around copyright and trademark. Okay. Like, and analytics around that area, who seem to be claiming that none of these services had had any effect. And I'm going to be, this is going to be the mathematician of me coming out. But they said it had no effect on the absolute number of visits to pirate sites and the piracy that was going on. Really? And they were trying to... Well, the thing is, this, this, you know, raised an eyebrow for me for a number of reasons. One, the article that reported this also was like, the number of internet users still continues to increase year on year. There was no data for re... Well... I couldn't seem to find any data for the regions. Yeah. Or, you know, comparing... 
because diff- well, different countries have different copyright laws, and that's where yeah. part of the problem is for the the big companies, and that China's a lot more lax, say. Yeah. And it's going to be those countries with the still developing copyright laws that are now just becoming internet users. So I'm not going to go ahead and like say anything, any sweeping statements, but without the regional data and the more granularity to it to break it up, I kind of saw that whole report as a big load of, you know, it's it's saying, for some reason it's got, it's saying piracy, piracy might be at its highest for like absolute number of cases, but unless you look at the actual percentages and the trends yeah. in behaviour, that actually says nothing. No, exactly, yeah. So that's that's me getting on my little statistics box as a mathematician going, this is bad data. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway yeah um I'm I wanted to this is still well I like to go off on wild tangents to other stories but I thought I would finish this one up with a story that's a bit more positive it's a story of a game studio paying out to a consumer hmm. so reported by multiple sites I think the original story was PC Gamer uh, Steam user and security researcher Artem Moskowski recently found a bug in Steam's programming which could mean that a user could get unlimited copies of any game oh, with an incredibly that. simple exploit. Yeah. Um, so, in thanks for him finding this and they've now been able to presumably solve it, Valve have paid Artem $20,000 as a reward. Wow. So, I think that's as much as it is a part of a scheme run by Valve where they pay if people report exploits, because obviously it's a lot cheaper that way than, you know... Losing that many lose... games, yeah. Exactly. Wow, that's but I still thought, still thought it was a good system to run, and obviously he's been compensated for doing like good work. Apparently it was just something incredibly simple, and he was able to generate just multiple keys for any game he wanted. <laughs> um... So yeah, Nintendo recently won $12 million in a lawsuit against an illegal ROM distributor, sending a warning to them and showing that this isn't a game. The other ROM distributors, of course, know this isn't a game, otherwise it'd be available on their site for free. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, here all night. (laughs) So, our next story is the Game Awards. So whilst they are seen to some as video gaming's answer to the Oscars, the reality is that the, cas- the comparison's only apt and that's both are a great chance for the industry to pat itself on the back. However, at least the Game Awards are voted for by the gamers, not, you know, the Academy. Yeah. So, I, you know, the last story ran kind of long, so I haven't got as much notes for this. I thought I'd just say, do you, have you seen any of the nominations? I have not, no. Has Spider-Man got anything? Oh, Spider-Man, this has been... This is just, like, a good year for Sony, to be honest. Yeah. So, uh, Spider-Man has received nominations in Game of the Year, uh, Best Action Adventure Game, Mm -hmm. Best Game Direction, Nice. Best best Narrative, Good. Best Music, (laughs) Yep. Best Audio Design, Yep, should win all of these. Uh, Yuri Lowenfall has been nominated for Best Performance as Peter Parker. Oh, yeah. Which I agree with. I think he did a very good job. Yeah. And I'm honestly just, like, looking down the list at the moment. Yeah, that's everything for Spider-Man. However, also, God of War came out this year, so God of War has got a lot of nominations. Is that Sony as well, then? That's Sony as well. Wow. Wow. And obviously it's a multi-platform game, but Red Dead Redemption 2 has gotten a fair share of nominations as well. Uh Uh-huh. Um, what I thought was very interesting based on what I've heard, obviously I've not played it, but Assassin's Creed Odyssey has received a Game of the Year nomination. Okay. Which I thought was, you know, maybe making up the list. (laughs) Another one which I thought was... Definitely something to congratulate it for, but also thought it was very cute any idea that it might win, but Mega Man 11 <laughs> has received a nomination for Best Action Game. Aww, that is cute. Which is, which is good, because obviously, I think this is probably the first time Mega Man game has received any kind of nomination for an award in a while. 
definitely. Yeah. And obviously it's a good rec- it's a good um indicator obviously of the series return to form. But I don't think it's going to win. <laughs> Well, but as but, you say as well, it's it's nice that like it's the people's vote more than hmm. just some, as you say, like the academy or. And there's one or two ones on here that you've never seen BoJack Horseman, have you? No. So just there's an episode of BoJack Horseman where one of the characters is asked to give the Oscar nominations, but he loses the envelope, so he just makes them up on the spot. <laughs> okay. And ends up nominating films that weren't even released that year. <laughs> uh, and obviously there's a category here called best ongoing game so obviously a game doesn't need to be released that year to be nominated but No Man's Sky's got a nomination <laughs> <laughs> and that just made me picture someone being like what other ongoing video games are there Yeah. and No, no Man's Sky's not even really like a live <laughs> service it just got <clears throat> a big big update this year yeah. That just delivered on a bunch of its original promises that was supposed to be in at launch. Yeah. So obviously obviously a nomination is good for any game. But that one I was like, that's funny. <laughs> I'm still quite excited. I sh- I might get that when it comes down even more in price. The thing is it, it was depreciating I... age for ages and then when they released this update it's now kind of like at a pretty Well the thing is now it's got actual multiplayer, I'd actually be interested in like playing yeah. it with a few friends and just like messing around to see what it's like but yeah it's now forever tainted by its reputation yeah of course well it's like uh, uh it's like battlefront is like a completely different game now to how it started yeah two i should say One but uh cool. finn on the ground for nominations is actually nintendo but they've not actually had that many games released this year so the only category where they are literally dominating the field as in every entry into that category has been released on Nintendo Switch even if it's been released on other platforms is of the course Nintendo best Nintendo Switch award uh well close it's best family game oh so best family game being between Mario Tennis the Nintendo Labo which was that giant cardboard you know add on for the Switch yeah, I remember it Overcooked 2 which is very good I've had a little play of it but it's very fun um, Starlink Battle for Atlas which is I believe gets a PC release as well but primarily Switch mm-hmm. and Mario Party that is really bad on other developers and stuff that those are the only family games you can get is from Nintendo anymore that's the thing yeah in one hand it's like well Nintendo are very good at what they do but on the other hand it's like surely someone else should be on this list <laughs> um but yeah, and other well, I was gonna say a, a, the only other one I'll probably give a shout out to because I enjoy playing it myself is Dragon Ball Fighters has received a best fighting game nomination, mm-hmm. which is very well deserved. That game is very fun, but I, I mean I don't play it in anywhere close to competitively, but you know, <laughs> bit of fun. So yeah, if you want to look up the full list of nominees, they are available online. There is a video from Jeff Keighley where he made the announcements uh, but yeah I'm going to be honest I'll probably forget to watch the show again this year and just catch up on the updates the day, day after <laughs> uh, so the game awards nominees are out for such awards as best game, best direction best soundtrack Ubisoft and Rockstar were shocked to hear there was not actually an award for best use of testicles so they both tried so hard in Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Red Dead Redemption 2 to get the award. Talk about being blue balled. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of stills and promo images going around about those. <laughs> well, you know, they were just going for that award and then... It's a goddamn he'll... shame that there wasn't that award. I think we should contact Jeff Keighley who organises Game Awards ourselves and be like, there should be a Best Use of Testicles award. <laughs> Um, I I don't know who would win it to be honest. <laughs> I mean, the ones in Odyssey were bigger, right? Yeah, but apparently the uh, apparently the ones in Red Dead on the horse like swing in the breeze or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine like doing that as a game developer, like <laughs> pro programming horse testes. That's what the crunch was for that you reported on a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, it was 
hundred hour weeks to get the to get hundred hour the, weeks, guys. I want every hair on that ball bag to get the swing just in right. The wind. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, uh, PlayStation have come out this week and said they aren't going to be present at E three next year which is a major break in tradition for Sony since they've appeared at every E3 since its inception 24 mm. years ago. Uh, so, in a quote, a uh, representative from Sony uh, said, As the industry evolves, Sony Interactive Entertainment continues to look for inventive opportunities to engage with the community. PlayStation fans mean the world to us, and we always want to innovate, think differently, and experiment with new ways to delight gamers. As a result, we've decided not to participate in E3 in 2019. We're exploring new and familiar ways to engage our community in 2019, and can't wait to share our plans with you. So does so that mean you think? they're gonna they're gonna just do a live stream from like some Sony conference room? That's what I don't get because they, from what they said, they're not going to be engaging at all because Nintendo now Nintendo still has a floor presence, but they haven't done a an actual press conference in years because they do their Nintendo Directs which are pre-recorded and then they stream them. Yeah. Um, Xbox still do a full show um, and other third-party developers, <laughs> some of them have press conferences but a lot of them actually hold them at venues nearby to the convention centre rather than the actual convention centre. Right. So, <laughs> it's one of those things that it's... I mean, I'd be very, very... I'm very sceptical that there won't be anything from Sony during E3 or that they won't tact tactically do something just after or just before to try and get headlines you know what I mean? yeah I get you so, um, or do you reckon they'll just sort of work with the uh, developer of the games and try and get a lot more of these like exclusively for Playstation kind of deals so well that's a that's a thing they could do the deals beforehand and then say an EA's press conference or Ubisoft's they could be saying oh this is going to be a timed exclusive for PS4 so there's still stuff news for PS4 but they're not actually there yeah um, no, exactly so some sites have speculated that Sony are not turning up because they're not going to have any major titles to show because titles such as Death Stranding and The Last of Us Part 2 which are kind of two of the heavily anticipated ones mm -hmm. have already been shown off quite a bit mm. um, and actually being at E3 is quite an expensive PR stunt so they might be just you know saving a bit of money Yeah, but like like we said um, it could they could just be circumventing it with a live stream or some other method that's going to get to just as many people but isn't going to is just a bit more basic and a bit more straight and a bit more straightforward yeah um, so on the theme of major platform holders ditching things uh, <laughs> recent reports of multiple sites are suggesting a discless Xbox One announcement is coming so maybe that'll be their big E3 announcement next year for Microsoft oh, Yeah. Um, but then if we're getting rumours now the announcement might be a bit sooner so, what do you think about a digital-only console, no disk drive? Fine. I mean, well, fine as long as the the prices kind of depreciate and the prices kind of go at roughly the same rate as hard copies. I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's the thing because games nowadays require to be require installation from disc on Xbox One and I don't yeah. know about PS4 yeah they do so it's not as if you're really saving that much time well it's just usually like when I look at like a digital version of a game it's it's sometimes like five quid more and it's and like to get it digital and I'm like you're getting less here <laughs> I mean you, admittedly the, the case and the disc are like a matter of pennies or pounds or whatever but like I don't know. I just quite. I'm, well, I'm the th quite... the interesting thing is, I read a while ago. Uh, it's probably, well, you'd you'd assume it's either no longer true or will very soon no longer be true. But actually, there was a report saying that due to the 
server costs and like the hosting costs and the costs of like people downloading stuff it was actually just as expensive if not more expensive to get a di- for the publisher for you to get a digital version of their game rather than a physical oh really but I'm guessing with like the increase in technology that's going to be a thing of the past pretty yeah, soon yeah of course yes you can get space from tiny yeah. things now um, I think this has been something that Xbox have wanted to do for a while um, going back to when the Xbox One was announced and there was a whole big thing about game discs like linking to consoles yeah. basically as a means of killing off the second hand games market um, but I don't know I think as long as there's always the option for both it's going to be fine because there, you're always going to have people who have more of an affinity for physical media because I know you see you're getting rid of a lot of your DVDs and Blu-rays because you're going to more digital only. Yeah. Whereas I still quite digital. like having all the boxes for now. I don't know yeah. what I'm going to do in the future. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, if you just make if you make things convenient enough, people will switch. I think. Yeah. Like, why why isn't there? I mean, you got like PS Plus on PlayStation Four, but like with PS Plus, I think you only get kind of like a couple of like games that aren't that kind of big like a month or something like that hmm. um, whereas if they did some kind of geez, it's a very subscription service heavy episode but like <laughs> why why not have something where you can like kind of digitally rent a game one at a time or something I don't know hmm. so you could you could play like you could pay however much a month and like you you play you you um, download and play The Last of Us and then when you're done it like takes off that download and you can download something else I don't know yeah that's the thing like, it needs to be uh, consumer friendly at the end of the day doesn't it yeah um, but obviously that would give you a limit to like the multiplayer stuff but um, I don't know who knows who knows um, so now I've just listed a bunch of headlines, basically, as side stories, as in I've written no notes on these, so I'm just going to go through them, pr- like, you know, line at a line. Yeah. So the first two are just following up from the last news, gaming news we did two weeks ago. Uh, the first one's a bit of a sadder one. It's uh, Telltale Games has entered liquidation, mm, that's all and nice. some of its games have now been delisted from Steam, so yeah. it seems uh, cut- cutting you know, getting rid of a lot of stuff and, well, they just weren't able to save the studio, clearly. Or maybe it'll get bought up by someone or something, but it's not looking great. Mm, that is a shame. They're, they're pretty fun to play, those things. Um, and following up on last week's story about the PlayStation Classic, in an interview this week, Reggie fils uh president of Nintendo America, has said there's not going to be a Nintendo 64 Classic anytime soon. So, that's fine. Like, I wasn't, like... Well, I still have my old N64, so it's easy for me to say that, but... <laughs> I'm not surprised, because basically he was very honest about it. It was like, the NES and the SNES were basically to help with the transition from Wii U to Switch. Basically, they are there to make some money whilst we moved over consoles. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's... I'm not surprised at all. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it would have helped if they... Would have helped if they stocked them properly in the first place. Yeah. And then they could have sold more in 2016 and not have to do another big shipment in 2018 but I mean they're saying this now but like when when the PlayStation Classic hits and it sells how it's going to sell kind of thing are they not going to mm. be like this is a market we should really be well that's the thing is if people keep demanding it and obviously the PlayStation Classic does really well they're definitely going to flip on that they're definitely going to be like actually no we want the money no they'd rather get the money by suing people who are making their own <laughs> fucking ROMs for it. Yeah. They'd rather sue the people distributing the N64 ROMs than that's make their, an N64 that's their bus- classic. That's their, mis- their business plan. Because uh, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they make their own 64, then people won't be making the 64 ROMs. So exactly. they can't sue them. Yeah. Um, clever. Clever Nintendo. I like it. It's Brutal. one of those... Uh, it's that meme with the guy pointing his head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, continuing on the theme of Nintendo, and actually these I included because we've talked about it before, 
but this week YouTube became available on Switch, being the first kind of video streaming service to get an app on there. Wow. Which I, I know you talked about a lot last series. I did, I said about Netflix and stuff on there. Hmm. And on the flip side of, you know, some coming, some going, uh, video services are ending on Wii. Oh. Which is actually kind of surprising that they're still going on the Wii. Wait, hang on, ending? So as in, like, you will no longer be able to use Netflix and stuff on the Wii. You wouldn't be able to use it? Yeah, no. That's weird. They're dropping support for it. Okay, well, dropping support, they, that you you can probably use the older versions of the apps, right? I'm not really sure, because I don't know how the mechanics of it work, but it says that, well, the headline exactly is Nintendo might be suspending all Wii video services. So clearly, huh. it's a Nintendo-led thing. Yeah. But it must be difficult for services like Netflix to continue supporting old consoles anyway. Well, I mean, I've I've got, like, an old iPad sat, sat in front of me, and, like, it wouldn't let me download the, the Netflix app, but then, like, because I had it downloaded already on the App Store, it let me re-download it kind of thing. And it still, right. it still streams, it just doesn't, um, doesn't update. Yeah. So it's a bit of a... But then, obviously... Because like, that would be a real bummer if you're kind of using that still as, like, your main kind of... Yeah, I'd also be very surprised if you were. But it, there are definitely people out there who probably still use their Wii a lot for that yeah. kind of thing. Oh, j- just the Wii, not the Wii U. Yeah, just the Wii. That's why I was saying I was surprised uh, it hadn't okay. already happened. Yeah, okay, no, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty ancient. <laughs> yeah. That's over ten years old now. I take back everything I just said. Update you bricks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and have you seen the teaser trailer for Neantic's Harry Potter game? No. Uh, it is about a minute long. It just involves somebody like apparating in, casting a spell on a golden snitch, and then catching it. And oh, Niantic it. is the uh, Pokemon, Pokemon Go, Go people. Yeah. Oh no, I'm, I'm not interested. Nor am I. That gets released <laughs> next year, though. That's why it's only a footnote. Good. Have fun, everyone, playing that. And final, my last story. As you know, in this podcast, I like ending with a bit of a weird one. Uh, <laughs> in Japan, uh, Mega Man is teaming up with Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worth looking up because I'm, there's no real thing about any of the details. There's just been some key art released, and it's just Mega Man with like massive set of wings on him. And it's like, <laughs> sure. He doesn't need wings. What's the, what are they doing? He's got the he's dog. Got, he's got rocket boots. That's true, yeah. doesn't need wings. Okay, so we've come to that point in the episode where we need to talk about uh, the <laughs> Fantastic Beasts, the crimes of Grindelwald. We're going to start with non-spoilers. Um... Probably won't last long in non-spoilers. Ten minutes, maybe? Let's see how we get on, really. Let's see how we get on. But we'll put the time codes in the description. Just skip ahead if you don't want to hear anything. Phil. Yeah. What did you think of the film? I... F- <laughs> My honest opinion <laughs> is that film was maybe one of the biggest messes I've seen in quite some time. <laughs> Yes. Possibly since Batman v Superman. Wow. <laughs> that was... Okay. Well, yeah. contrary to that, I think it was one of the biggest disappointments I've seen in a long time, possibly since The Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> I um, literally, whilst we we're, we're just we just had a quick break, and literally in my head I went, I'm going to compare it to Batman v Superman, I bet Nick's going to call it Harry Potter's Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so okay, so that's, the, that's just the, the only thing I've written in the notes section for non spoilers is in capital letters don't rant too much, people quite like this franchise. <laughs> that's the thing. I was at a housewarming party last night and I'd just seen it, and no one else had seen it, and someone asked me for my star rating. <laughs> And I was worried about going too low because I don't want to get any follow-up questions. Yeah. And I was in a room with quite big Harry Potter fans. And yeah. still, <laughs> not wanting to go too low with a star rating score, I said two and a half. 
<laughs> I thought she being generous. So I don't know how it's going to change after this discussion because, like, sometimes me and you chatting about a film obviously gives a bit more clarity on things. Yes, um, but and also I I just want to point out at the beginning here because I don't really want to go up against. We haven't. <laughs> this podcast hasn't got like a huge following and therefore we haven't got like the support if we if we go on and run too much about it and the support that the opposite will be where you get the the super fans who will comment defend, and defend it to death and how yeah. how did you not understand that bit it was yeah. written on Pottermore please don't be angry at us um and the thing is as well as that I actually I, I like the Harry Potter films. <laughs> oh no, that's the thing. I love the Harry Potter films. I went. Yeah. I've been on the. I've got uh, a wand. The, I've got a wand. Been on the I've, studio tour. Loved been it. On the studio tour. Yeah, I've drank butter beer. I've yep. got some merch. So this um, is. I enjoyed the first Fantastic yeah. Beast film as well. <laughs> I want to throw that out there. <laughs> so I'm going to very quickly go over my thoughts on the first Fantastic Beast film. I think I actually restate them on this okay. Friday's Lego Harry Potter. Watch the Let's Plays. Um, but I think what I said is to you and that and it is true is like I enjoyed the film but my least favourite bit was like the plot they were trying to set up for more films if yes. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them had just been a cute little film about a man <laughs> trying to recapture his animals and Eddie Redmayne being a bit awkward and you know yeah. a good supporting cast I would have loved it I'd have been like mm-hmm. cool it's basically like Harry Potter's Rogue One um but it wasn't like that. Uh, it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It had to set up that whole thing with Johnny Depp at the end, and I was like, I'm not really sure if I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> and then I saw a few tweets from people I follow on Twitter. They didn't spoil anything, but they said they didn't enjoy it, and I was like, ooh. So I was like, still before the cinema, I was like, I'm gonna keep, you know, positive about this. Yeah, because you know I've, I disagree with lots of people on films. Me and you disagree on films. Yeah, but then like afterwards, um, I turned to my friend who I went to go see it in the cinema with and just said, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> well, like if you thought the first film was like jarring in terms of um, the sort of fun cutesy stuff compared to like the the dark stuff where you've got like the obscurus and like Grindelwald and stuff like that. If you thought that was jarring. <laughs> Wait until you see this. Yes. Because <laughs> this is like, for the most part, pretty dark with just some like incredibly cuddly, fluffy animals just kind of with Eddie Redmayne like gurning around for a bit. Like <laughs> It was very... thrown it was thrown in just so they could call it Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, basically. Um, so they've kind of put that as the linchpin of this franchise now they have to call each film Fantastic Beasts yeah it, it screams so, poor planning doesn't it so, so they've got to have a, at least one scene in every film where Eddie Redmayne's got to like trap a beast in a briefcase or something <laughs> <laughs> it'll be in like the middle of like the dramatic wizarding war or something where like someone's like <laughs> dying of something and they'll be like oh shit we haven't put in a <laughs> we haven't got no, a, a hilarious beast in, in here yet, so we've got to have a funny interlude scene where Eddie Redmayne's doing a funny dance or something to try and. That's what it will be. It will <laughs> be one of those scenes that takes place in a field of the two opposing sides having a battle, but just yeah. one. It'll be Eddie Redmayne on his hands and knees chasing an animal through the battle. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee that's how what will happen in the fifth film. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> Let's just talk about cast. I thought I like Eddie Redmayne. I think he makes yeah. a very good lead. Yeah. I think like I wasn't this... that sure of him originally in the first movie, but um he's he's quite charming and he's he's they kind of they they exaggerate his personality to like feel a bit more of the outcast, whereas in the previous movie it was kind of hard to get a grasp of that, whereas I actually felt like he was like not seen as like a very serious person and I but like he was He's he's deep down a very good person. He just maybe doesn't take on as much responsibility as he should, kind of thing. And I I feel like that came across pretty well in this film. Yeah. So I think the supporting players from the first film all do a reasonably good job as well. I do like the. I I'm gonna be embarrassed here and say I don't actually know any of the other cast names. This is very poor research on my part. I should probably just 
But you've got Ezra Miller returning. This is this is not a spoiler to say he returns because he's in all the marketing. Um, returns I'll say as what's his name? Credence. Credence. Um, See, I just don't like Ezra Miller in really? anything. Oh, you didn't like him in Justice League, did you? No, I thought he was really annoying, and I didn't oh. like. I, he was just kind of there for this, like. Yeah. Oh yeah, th- th- like no one really gets a lot to do in this movie. Um, that's I'll be thing. honest. It's got several plots, so it can't actually spend too long on one. Yeah. It just will randomly go to the other one. I think um, Johnny Depp was phoning it in. <laughs> Johnny Depp looked drunk for half. <laughs> like at the beginning. Uh, so actually, no, I won't go into that. Uh, I will leave that for spoiler chalk but there is an implication in the film that um, uh, Grindelwald can't speak and I honestly thought that's because for parts of the Caribbean they had to feed him his lines for an earpiece <laughs> so they're like just taking out any like worry yeah um, so I in my professional way I've just brought up the cast list I think Catherine Waterston who was Tina does a very good job uh, so Dan she's in the film yeah, when she's very briefly in the film. Uh, Dan cameos. Dan Fogler as Jacob, the uh, the nomad or muggle from the first one. I yep. like him a lot, as well yep. as I do Alison Sudol, who plays Queenie. I liked her in the first film. I thought she was atrocious in this film. Oh no, I think she had a few good bits, but and sadly, I think it's the writing that let her down in this one, but we'll get on to that. Yeah. Uh, there is a cameo by somebody that gets mentioned in the Harry Potter books that is very forced. Wait, is this Nicholas Flamel? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> is that your phone? No, I think that might be something outside. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I won't bother editing that. <laughs> um, Nicholas Flamel is in the trailers as well, so... Oh, so that's not a spoiler. Oh, that's not a spoiler to say, yeah. Um... But yeah, I think I'm starting to get to the edge of what I can say. Oh, well, you got Jude Law as as Dumbledore. See, I like Jude Law. Actually, yes. no, I thought he did well. Yeah, I thought I thought he did very well. I bought um, him as Dumbledore. Yes, it's, it's like not very close to the previous portrayal, but like it's it's a bit more of like a active character, I guess, which is quite nice to see. Hmm. Um. With some new, like, nice visual tricks, and like, a, you see a little bit of different kind of magic that he uses, and it's just uh, that stuff's pretty good. It's in the trailer as well. You get to see Hogwarts, um, although we don't spend much time at Hogwarts. No, but that stuff's really fun. Yeah, like it's just kind of nice to be back there. I like that's purely from nostalgia. Objectively, that does not, <laughs> that should not improve the film, but also. No. Who hasn't grown up on these films? And um, and I defy you to not get a little bit nostalgic when you see it on screen. Yeah, I mean, there's some other supporting casts that we possibly might talk about more in the spoilers. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say, we'll pro- I think we'll score it at the end of spoilers, but for now I'd say if you like Harry Potter, there's a good chance you might like this, so go yes. see it. But if you watched Harry Potter and were like, not that fast, then don't bother. Well, I mean, you say that even if you have seen Harry Potter and you like and you love Harry Potter, I still think this is probably no. That's what I mean. Is you. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'm talking about the hardcore Potter fans. Yeah. Like they will probably enjoy it. Yeah. But if you only if it's only a passing fancy, then don't. <laughs> Wait for it on streaming services and then decide it's whether pretty... you want to go see the third one. As a film as well, aside from the Harry Potter connections, like it's pretty oddly... It's convoluted and badly paced. Um, I mean, J.K. Rowling's an excellent like writer of in, in book form and novel form. But like this feels like... Because the pacing feels like they, they started writing it... She started writing it as a book. Yeah. And then instead of instead of writing a book, then it being adapted into a screenplay where bits are cut out it felt like she started writing it as a book and then realised that it's like a page per minute of screen time kind of thing so then decided to try and wrap it up in like after having written 200 pages or whatever I don't know No, uh, it's funny you should say that I was like thinking about that after I watched it yesterday 
I think this Fantastic Beast thing would have been so much better as a TV show. Yeah, it would. Because it would have given the breathing space to all these plot lines that as a result feel rushed and messy and don't, yeah, don't really gel. Yeah, exactly. Or at least, I don't know, it should have just been written as a, I mean, it's it's time, isn't it? Writing a book and then adapting it is, is a long old process, but... And Warner Brothers want that money now. Yeah, that's true. So you'll crank them out, goddammit. Anything else to say in non-spoilers? No. (laughs) No, me neither. We made it about ten minutes, though, like we said. Okay, that's not so bad. Okay, spoilers from now on. Snake Um, kills Dumbledore. Yeah... So that was just a that was just a trial one in case you hadn't shut off, but now we actually are going to do spoilers. Yeah, real spoilers from now on. Um, okay, so the first thing I just want to talk about and get out of the way is J.K. Rowling has said, I'm pretty sure multiple times that Dumbledore and Grindelwald were lovers, um, and yet this film manages to kind of slap that notion down. Aside from like one line about being closer than brothers. Because the real in the trailer they say, you hear Dumbledore say, "I can't move against Grindelwald," and like the assumption is, "Oh, because they're in love," but it turns out they kind of brushed that aside and turned it into some bullshit Horcrux MacGuffin thing that means they can't fight because of just their blood brothers or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It, again, it was just heavily implied rather than like explicitly stated and it was kind of like I guessed before the end of the film that that's what the little thing was it was something that would stop them from killing each other the same way that Harry and Voldemort can you know they had that problem as well seems to be a common thing not being able to kill each other in the magical world it really is but I feel like this kind of it was almost insulting how they 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 brushed apart they brushed past that that love story because to be honest that's I think the film was also lacking a bit of a a real love story because obviously you've got the separation between Queenie and um, Jacob which I will t- I'll talk about a bit more later don't you worry um, mm. Tina and Newt sort of barely seem to be talking for this film like I don't know like the romance could have come in a very progressive way by by actually just tackling like that that head on and saying yeah they were lovers like we're, we're doing this in a mainstream film hmm. I mean there this is film... also the thing it was set in the 1920s so I'm not going to like excuse it but at the same time the wizarding world is probably just as regressive as the regular world in that time period or well, maybe but like again like you, you're allowed to kind of twist history sometimes by in order to give yourself good representation as a film I think that's that's a very important thing to do this yeah. is a film that's they're afraid to do a gay love story and yet two babies are killed in this film <laughs> yes like, <laughs> which <laughs> how does that make sense on censorship grounds <laughs> like <laughs> yeah damn I forgot about that yeah. well I didn't forget but it's just you this saying I mean it so about... plainly yeah, well, this is what I mean about this like this jarring difference in tone, because literally one minute you've got Eddie Redmayne kind of tumbling around, being all fun, trying to cage this big Chinese dragon-style monster, and then the next you're just like, oh, okay, here's a baby, it drowned. Yeah, no, it remind like the first film had echoes, like it had hints of, of this, when you had like the fun, oh, Eddie Redmayne's trying to catch his monsters. And then he gets given the death penalty. And there's yeah. a very deeply disturbing film where one of them almost dies. In like an acid bath or something. It's yeah. very odd. Very weird change of tone. And this is this is even more jarring than that film. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no. I, yeah. If I just want to talk briefly about that scene as well. When... Okay, so Lita Lestrange. She was on a trip to New York, right? Yeah, this is part. This is like it's it's such a convoluted story. It's and this, so, it's such a it's such a 
mishmash of plots and stuff. Lita Lestrange was on a trip to New York. Lisa Lestrange was taught by Dumbledore alongside Newt. Happened to go on a trip to New York, swapped her baby brother for someone who apparently happens to be Dumbledore's brother, took him to New York where Newt happened to be several years later, who, like, the baby grew up to be Ezra Miller, who made friends with Nagini, who had one day happened to be the pet snake of Voldemort, who was also taught by Dumbledore. It's, it's such a... It's a mess. Know, I, I, it is a mess, and... Like what, like what happened with the Star Wars prequels. Or I think this is worse than the Star Wars prequels, if I'm being brutally honest. Because, like, where that made you feel like the universe was was shrunken, where where you had C three PO being built by Darth Vader, kind of thing. Like mm. this is arguably worse because everyone seems to know everyone in this universe. Yeah, the entire the entire Wizarding world is what like fifty families yeah. at most. <laughs> At most, yeah. I don't even think I could count that many, honestly. It's 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 bizarre. And everyone's just bumping into each other in Paris as well, like they'll literally turn street corners and bump into another main character. Yeah. Like Paris, this massive, massive place. Yeah. And then they're just like, Oh, hello. Fancy mate you knew here. Exactly. Um and then there's like you're you're taking away some of the interesting dynamics of these characters by okay you still get Newt and Jacob which is still quite a good fun combo yeah still like them but, yeah but taking Queenie away and what they did with her character I thought was incredibly unlikable well the thing is they go from being like happily together yeah. to basically being separated in the first scene they're in Exactly, and just prior in about to them thirty se- seconds. So just prior to them separating as well, she she brings Jacob. She drugs up Jacob, and attempts to marry him without his will or consent. And then she flew off in a strop when he got mildly irritated. When he was like, "Actually, maybe we should think." And he was thinking about her because it's still like illegal in America. Yeah. Yeah. But like, and, also, yeah. they also Eddie Redmayne says, "Oh, oh, you've enchanted him, haven't you?" And like that may sound very cute and very magical, but it's basically got the same effects as drugging someone. But it's basically just a more cutesy version of the Imperious Curse, which is one of those like illegal spells in the yeah. Wizarding world. Just saying, enchanted. Imagine that in court. No, Your Honor, I didn't spike her drink. I simply enchanted her. Oh, that's okay. Then that's much more wholesome and charming. <laughs> this film is just like not okay on so many levels, and then, and then <sighs> so like, when her turn to the dark side does eventually come in like the closing scenes, I couldn't give a, f- a flying fuck because her characterization has been so like broken in this film compared and to the previous. Her one. story was given no screen time either. Her no. scenes go from fighting with Jacob, yeah, to being in Paris. <laughs> then she goes for tea with that lady and meets Grindelwald. Yeah. And despite the fact she's like she hates him, by the end of the film she's like, "Well, he does make a damn good cup of tea. I guess I'm a fascist now." <laughs> and then goes oh, off. Like I get the yeah. whole wanting to be married to him, but like mm-hmm. you can't empathize with her train of thought at all. She just And it's been 6 flips. months since they met. Yeah. It's been six months that they met, and she's even if drugging it wasn't, him into marrying Even if it marrying wasn't illegal, her. it's probably still too soon to get married. She's turned from like a really good, charming character, like into someone who literally met someone six months ago, drugs them into coming to England so they can marry, and then fucking off when he gets mildly irritated at being enchanted, and then she just turns into a fucking fascist at the end. It's, it feels forced in order to increase the stakes for future films to be honest yeah yeah that was just like no I liked her character in the first one and then it was just like and also they kind of hand wave away why Jacob can remember all of this like yes they, were like, they do don't they yeah it was like oh it only takes away bad memories but all of my memories were good and it's like surely a better explanation would be some kind of spell that can reverse the you know the obliviate and she yeah. just did that to him not this also, ma- some people must have some quite good memories from like the first one 
Yeah, that means some people probably do remember all the wizards and stuff because it was her imagine birthday. If, imagine, imagine if someone was getting rained on by the uh, Obliviate spell, but like they'd rem- they they were remembering when like I don't know their rival shop was destroyed by a cloud or something, and they're like, ah, that's a good memory. Oh wait, no, there was a fucking <laughs> flying cloud in that first one, wasn't there? Yeah, it's just sloppy. Yeah. Um, what else have I got in my notes? <laughs> Johnny Depp was awful. I've put drunk, probably. Um, yeah, quite he... an entertaining scene was when he took a a puff from some skull emo shisha pipe and then predicted the <laughs> war. That was fun. <laughs> Again, it's like I get that. Obviously, one of Harry Potter's core themes is obviously the the analogies to fascism. Yeah. But in that situation where he can see there's a war happening, surely there's a better line of reasoning than. <laughs> Well, we should do a war first <laughs> for their own good. Yeah. We do a war that we'll probably win, then there won't be another war where they'll die. So we're actually yeah. being kind. <laughs> oh, it's just what is going on in this film? Ezra Miller's story, and he turns out to be a Dumbledore. With I, I just don't see oh how that's physically possible. How old was like how what is the age difference supposed to be between Ezra Miller and Jude Law in this was my main thing. like it, you'd think like 20 years at least it's just such a arse pull yeah and just I just by that point in the film I just didn't care either no uh, because he's just like oh I really want to find out who I am but I really don't trust this Grindelwald guy and then at the end he's like yeah all right I guess it's it's so this oh my, film's so convoluted there's, there's, yeah. there's, there's, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've missed out several stories as well but I'm struggling to remember them oh no but the bit that just uh. oh there was Lita and her brother oh yeah that, and the oh yeah had... was long lost brother or something yeah there's so much going on in this movie and yet no, nothing happened. Sorry, just to go back to that whole Grindelwald credence thing. He's asked, like, Grindelwald is asked by his like henchman, should we go get credence then? He goes, No, he will come to me. And then he go then Grindelwald goes to him and gives them a map <laughs> <laughs> saying, Come here. <laughs> That's not him going to you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It's, oh, that was a mess. And I was actually really looking forward to this film. No, I was uh, I was what well, optimistic about yeah. it. Um, I think Claudia Kim as Nagini does a good job but has no real reason to be in the film. No. It's just another shoehorned in thing. Mm-hmm. The whole thing between uh, Tina and Newt, their big falling out being because she thinks he's engaged because of is, a photo that appears in presumably a British newspaper is, even though she lives in America and even though they he they specify throughout the story that they've been sending constant letters to each other yeah it just felt forced again to like drag out the will they won't they of it all yeah well this was like this is a film where they were just trying to drop the characters where they wanted to be at the end yeah, it was just a whole lot of set up and they didn't really care how they got there. Which, as you said, would have worked pretty well as a TV series format because, like, Game of Thrones does that. You kind of want to, like, pick the characters up and, like, drop them where they should be because of, like, what happens to them throughout that. But, like, just... This did not work as a film. No. And, um... The whole thing with the end where a bunch of them all die because they can't beat the blue fire and then... Nicholas from Mel turns up and is like, why don't you just do that thing where you stab the ground and then everything is fine? <laughs> um, it's, uh... Yeah. Oh yeah, he was part of the action in the end, wasn't he? Yeah, he just kind of... <laughs> won- he looks in his crystal ball, it shows him what's going to happen. Oh yeah, re- wait, did someone chat to him from a book or something? <laughs> I don't understand what that was. He's like, oh, I can't go. And his his magic picture book was like, no, you can do it. I, I, I'm, I'm so lost about what happened. I don't know what that was. Was that like meant? To, uh, I wish I had why a magic was... picture book that told me I could do anything. <laughs> why was Lita Lestrange's brother looking for Ezra Miller as well? Because he had some kind of 
because unbreakable vow with someone about something right? with his yeah with his father about getting revenge and that somehow meant killing Ezra Miller right somehow yeah um and oh my god <laughs> <sighs> yeah the, Oh, I'm like I'm trying to remember like one plot, and I'm like my brain's just going between all the plots. Like, what what happened? Yeah, what? so what? much, so much went on, and yet nothing happened. Yeah, Queenie turned to the dark side. Queenie turned to the dark side. Uh, Lita That's Lestrange right. dies oh, after yes. having a lot of focus on her. She just um. I thought the relationship between Newt and his brother was interesting, but oh yeah, again, his was in this as well, wasn't he? Yeah, was not really that explored, and no. and then the whole third wheel thing just gets resolved when she dies because clearly they're not going to be competing over the same woman anymore. <laughs> and I assume that they'll have some kind of heart to heart in maybe the I don't know the billion film. No, bring it back things. for the next film. Make sure, make sure bloody. What's her face? Tina. There's an awkward love triangle between Tina and Newt and, her, and his brother. Bring it back. <laughs> I mean, Bring then I really stop like empathising with the brother then because what he's basically <laughs> doing is just going after women that like Newt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, at least something would happen of like dramatic tension. Like, I just didn't feel. Though that. I, I literally felt nothing watching this, and I did watch a midnight screening, but like, it was very bland. And the thing is, I can. Some spells seem to work in some places, and like, I know it's something from the whole Harry Potter series, but in school you can kind of understand it more. Then yeah. not all of them know how to do everything. Yes. But like, at the end as well, all of Grindelwald's followers seem to know how to just apparate out of there and be fine. Yeah. But none of the good guys did until they did. And why? And like, why also can they... the ministry? Also, the Ministry of Magic goes to Hogwarts, and they're like, "Dumbledore, we need you. You're the most powerful wizard." And he's like, "Oh yeah, but I don't really want to get involved with this." And then they're like, "No, but you're the most powerful wizard in the world, Dumbledore. It's only you and Grindelwald. You're the most powerful wizard in the world." Bam! Here's some chains. They're going to monitor you. How the? How did they do that if he's the most powerful wizard in the world? <laughs> yeah, surely you could just take him off. Yeah, literally. He has to get them taken off at the end. And and also, I don't know, I thought, found that that was a very bit... Like, in the same way, like you said with the prequels with Darth Vader building C-3PO, saying that during this period of time, Dumbledore was just basically the strongest, and there was only one other <laughs> who could match him, makes the world yeah. seem very small. It really does. Like, the idea that their bond, or something like that, something from his past, could have been the reason why he could defeat Grindelwald. Not just the fact that, but you're really strong. <laughs> you could just go fight him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like the fact that he was a defence against a dark arts teacher, but... Yes, I, I like the Hogwarts stuff. Yeah, I'd, uh, the flashback was alright, if not a bit cliche. Yeah. It was great hearing the music again. When they first show Hogwarts and you hear the music, I think that was all really cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, liked the ministry. The ministry was kind of cool to see him a bit more in action. I like how the Ministry of Magic France says Ministry of Magic France, uh, <laughs> but we've never heard the Ministry of Magic in the UK say anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what else happened? Nothing. Nothing happened in this film. For some reason, what happened in New York got Newt banned from travelling overseas, even though arguably he saved everyone. They introduced, um, a, a, at least they introduced a new character of colour into the Harry Potter franchise, and then killed her off in the final scenes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then one of them's going to turn into a snake. So, great. I'm pretty sure at the beginning they try when you know the scene where they try and offer Newt the job, yes. and then some rival dude shows up and is like, "Oh, oh I yeah, put... that was another plot element that went nowhere." I'm pretty sure he doesn't appear in the rest of the film. <laughs> <laughs> he turns up once, and he turns out he's working for Grindelwald, and he's gonna like what he does is gonna get him famous for being a legend or something. And 
But like, when you see him at the beginning of the film, you assume there's going to be like some kind of rivalry between him and Newt in finding finding Ezra Miller first. But it just doesn't go anywhere. And that would have been a better film. Yeah. Like a very honestly, th- yeah. Rather than trying to click and drag all the characters where you want them, why not just have something a bit more close circuit and it's, it's Newt versus this angry guy from the Ministry and it's, it's a hunt to find and like you can still do the stakes but just make them a bit more background you could be like oh well Grindelwald Grindelwald is rising every day kind of thing and you don't have to show it all you could have even had more of um, Ezra Miller and Claudia Kim at the circus that lasts a scene <laughs> showing that they get along kind of and they're going to escape yeah. And then they escape, and the circus, rather than do anything about it, just goes, oh, fuck this, I'm out. Yeah. And leaves, and that's the last you hear of them from the entire film. You could take pretty much any scene from this film, and it could be an entire film by itself. Yeah, now that's why I compare it to Batman v Superman, because obviously the main thing we said about that was that it was several films trying to be one film, and this yes. has the same problem. And they've yeah. got five of these films. Could they not have spaced out a bit more? Yeah. And my, my, my comparison is like, like the last Jedi, they try and like add in a lot of lore, and they try and add in a lot of like prop plot progression. But ultimately, you're left kind of. I feel like the characters were probably less developed by the end of this than previously. Yeah, now I still don't really know much more about, say, Tina, hmm. who just basically spends the entire film being pissed off at Newt, <laughs> and Queenie, who spends the entirety of this film being pissed off at Jacob. Despite the fact that they, she drugged him up. It's fu- <sighs> like I get her wanting to marry him and it being illegal, and obviously, uh, six but, months, Phil, we've known sake. each other. Like when the dude's like talking about like suppressing like the non madges but it yeah. also says in like one sentence to you, oh, but I like your romance. It's like that's. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess people do buy into that stuff, like you know, the analog to ideology and stuff like that. But one thing yeah, I did quite so like was um, when the Ministry go in, and like, and Grindelwald manages to twist it that it's kind of like the Ministry who are the violent oppressors, kind of thing. You I know, I like kind of I like that. that. Was quite nicely handled. You know, that could have been that could have been very on the nose, but I, I actually thought that was pretty neat. And then one of his supporters attacks first and the other person responds by taking him out. And yeah. then it makes them look bad. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. Then, no, they don't just take her out, do they? I think they, they use the killing curse. Yeah. Yeah. And that just turns all of them against like the auras and No, I did I think that was very like that was very well done. Yeah. I would have liked to see a film of spin, basically. That that would have been more interesting as well. Like it's kind of Grindelwald building his like base rather than his, his, his followers rather than just like in that final scene just a load of followers just pop up like without him really having built that and he gives a very little speech uh, blows on his bong and then they're all like <laughs> I'm convinced <laughs> team Grindelwald <laughs> I mean his bong is, is shaped like a skull and they're not like this seems a bit sketchy <laughs> 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 if someone it's like uh, just imagine trying to imagine like a political rally where yeah. someone's got a skull <laughs> on their lectern as they give their speech yeah. they're yeah. not gonna get your confidence I know yeah. it's like magic a little, mustache, a little blonde moustache and a and a fake eye or whatever <laughs> like I know it's obviously the magic world and they get like they use like things of potions and stuff like that but still like a skull yeah uh. yeah <laughs> pretty good uh, so numerical score time uh, sh- should we uh, should we do what we do with Star Wars and rank the franchise is this including all the Harry Potters yes <laughs> well I, I think Ooh. we know the answer if it was including both the Fantastic Beasts <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to go first or alright yeah I'll go first okay uh, it's this is the worst yes uh, then probably one what is in Fantastic Beast 1 or Harry Potter 1 Harry Potter 1 ok uh, and then probably 2 and then I'd go Beasts 
and then I'd go eight, and then I'd go three, and then I'd go four. No, then I'd go six, then I'd go seven, then I'd go five, then I'd go four. So I'm going to do that again. <laughs> This one is the worst one, then uh, Philosopher's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, Fantastic Beasts, Deathly Hallows Part 2, Prisoner of Azkaban, Half-Blood Prince, Deathly Hallows Part 1, the other one, and then Goblet of Fire. <laughs> What's 5 called? Order of the Phoenix. I love Order of the Phoenix. Okay, that's interesting. See, uh, thing is... Okay, so I guess mine worst to best. Gonna be very much doing this on the fly like you. Yeah. This one was the worst. No question. Yeah. <laughs> um then beasts. But okay. bear in mind, the gap between this and beasts is probably the biggest gap between any film. <laughs> like this one was just that's so what much. I, that's why I was kind of I was like I was going into this and I was like, you know what, I don't really want to see like this a lot of like weird kind of darker stuff unless they do it like pretty well and committed to it kind of thing but I was like you know what the Harry Potter franchise ranges from average to pretty good hmm. so there's no way it's going to be below average yeah but oh boy it was um, so yeah num- uh, this one the original beasts yeah um, and then probably one two like you just for the fact that they're the early ones and they're the less polished ones yeah um Probably six. Okay. Uh, seven. Eight. Mm-hmm. Five. Oh. Three. Yeah. Four. Okay. That's not, not too dissimilar. Yeah. No, I think I like. I really like the time travel in number three, and I just really like the whole premise of number four. And I do yeah. like number five. To be yeah. fair, I like I could watch. I think the gap the gap Harry between film. the the gap between beasts and one two three four five six seven eight like it's it's pretty minimal. Yeah, uh, but like <laughs> this is distinctly worse. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> uh. That that will do it. Yeah. So numerical score. Uh, out of what ten? Yeah. Four. See, I was worried I was being a bit too harsh, but I was going to say four as well. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of Grindelwald and Where to Find Them Part Two is a four out of ten. And we actually agree on score. Yes. So now we're going to go on to a section called Don't At Me, which was uh, Nick's brainchild, and he did the first one back two weeks ago uh, when he talked about a horror film. Mm -hmm. And this is basically a section where we take something that we either really love or really hate, and we just have, I guess, unlike the rest of this podcast, where we're very restrained, we just have free reign to talk about whatever. Um, So I couldn't really... I was thinking along like things that possibly I didn't like controversial things I didn't like and I was like ah, none of those I really like care about my, enough to talk about because uh, yeah. we're already talking about Fantastic Beasts 2 <laughs> um, but no I want to talk about a show that I really really like and that if I'd been watched like I only, started, I only watched it for the first time at Christmas if I'd been watching it before then it definitely would have gotten probably nominations in every single one of our award shows so far for best TV show oh, okay. being nominated again this year uh, but Bojack Horseman on Netflix, great show. It's fantastically written. Uh, the premise is that it's in a world of like anthropomorphic animals just living alongside humans. But the main character, Bojack Horseman, is a washed up TV sitcom star who basically has does nothing. He's just a lazy piece of shit. Mm-hmm. And it's about him coming to his, dif- his, his various escapades like the first series about him trying to write his memoirs into a book but not actually doing anything so they hire him a ghostwriter which is um, 
voiced by well I should say Badger Horseman is voiced by Will Arnett um and then the ghost writer is voiced by uh, voiced by the person who does Annie in Community uh, Alison Brie okay um and then you've got a cast quite a colourful cast including his agent which is a cat um his kind of rival I put in inverted commas uh, called Mr. Peanut Butter who's a Labrador but <laughs> Mr. Peanut Butter just loves everyone uh, his roommate uh, at the time which is a guy called Todd um, yeah but anyway as the show progresses it gets very like at sometimes it is just like pure comedy other episodes are just like focusing on the issues that Hollywood actually has and they're quite like striking about it like in the whole midst of me too last year they did an episode on a beloved celebrity getting sexual assault claims against him and one of them trying to bring it to light and basically the whole process it goes through and how the news media cycle treats it and things like that they've yeah. done episodes similarly on gun control but also <laughs> they do very like personal stories and like bojack is just like very like he's a very broken individual and he just he's very distorted and he's got drug issues and they never try to like romanticize any of it he just does loads of stupid shit yeah and like they also do very like bold episodes like there's an episode done with entirely without dialogue and really? there's an episode done this season uh which was a eulogy for a character and the entire episode is just Will Arnett as Bojack giving a eulogy for 20 minutes right, okay. and it's so just... they do a bit of experimental kind of stuff as well with the format and they play around with <laughs> story structure as well so they will have episodes that don't quite go in the right order and but they all come together by the end and it's just really it really cool. yeah no. do they address the fact that they're all animals or is it kind of like family guy where you're kind of expecting just you just know they're talking uh, they do like quite good like puns on, like like plays on it and stuff like that like everyone's like aware they're an animal and stuff and it's it's the point is like they're like animal they're like animals which have appeared in films or whatever like a dog that appeared as like the dog in I don't know like a film or something well it's, well like the whole the whole world is like taken up by like anthropomorphic animals okay right so it's not like there aren't humans in it well no they're humans living alongside them so okay. like Todd is a human but like and the ghost writer um, uh, Diane is a human but obviously yeah. they're just it's never really like focused on but they also do quite good like background jokes and stuff with it like there's a scene where two people are eating in a restaurant and there is an anthropomorphic pig staring really like concerned at the next table over that I haven't put like a ham <laughs> And there's another per one where it's like an anthropomorphic lizard getting away from a date by blending into the background. And these are just like background gags. Yeah. So it's like a good animation team kind of thing. Yeah. What's the uh, story team? Is there anyone, anyone in particular? No one famous. Okay. But uh, the, the main guy who does it is very good at what he does. Yeah. Like, I don't know okay. of anyone with any kind of pedigree who does the writing behind it. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'd, I'd I, recommend I, I it. Might have to, I might have to give it a, a little watch on Netflix. I'll say that it's available on Netflix, right? <laughs> yeah, it's available on Netflix. The first season's probably the, a bit slow to start because at the, at the beginning it's a bit too much like standard sitcom fare of arrogant. Yeah. Arrogant dude does stupid thing and, you know. And um, it definitely develops in that as case, the show goes can, on. Can you give us a, an episode maybe to go and watch? Uh, there's a late season one episode which is quite good because as, <laughs> as he writes his memoirs you obviously learn more about him mm -hmm. and I'd say the first season is definitely worth watching um, but let me just just if you want one to kind of be like this is the, the show like with Rick and Morty I'd always recommend starting with like either like the the King Jelly Bean one just to like really throw people in at the deep end of like what this show is about kind of thing um I'd say episode 8 of the first series like is the first one that really gets you 
like into the fact that it's a different kind of show because okay. it's a kind because it takes kind of a bit of a turn at a point. Yeah. Um, up until then, it's all right, but um, I'd say that one has a moment in it where you're like, "Oh shit!" Okay. And then from like the second season onwards, it gets like really, really just keeps on getting better and better. And I think the last season was just really good as well. Awesome. So oh, Jack Horseman available on Netflix. Netflix. And yes, I think that brings us to the end of our show, if I'm not mistaken. That does bring us to the end. So, if you want to keep up to date with the Cynical Optimists in between episodes, we're on Twitter at Synopt Podcast. Especially yeah. keep an eye at the moment, because we'll be sharing if we do manage to get ourselves onto iTunes with the details of how to subscribe. Um, if you do want... Well, what I might do some point this week is share the RSS feed link, so you can actually add us to your streaming service of choice using the RSS feed if that service allows it anyway. Uh-huh. Um, you can follow me at Haddo Inc. Um, I'm, I'm at Mick Nortimer. And join us on Fridays where me and Nick are playing through Lego Harry Potter years one to four, uh, where we're learning spells and different other life skills. And we're so naive in that Let's Play so far. By episode five... No, we did six, didn't we? Yeah, so we've recorded up to six. So <laughs> seven. we're so naive about how crap this new Fantastic Beast film is. Yeah, because I, I think this Friday's episode, so that's, what, a few days' time, uh, yeah. we actually do our predictions for Fantastic <laughs> Beast 2. So oh, it's bless quite... us. So, bless us indeed. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, next week... Oh, we're off next week because it's Black Friday. So what we... Get some good deals... Well, we're going to be camping out for those deals, uh, but for the most part we found that a lot of gaming and film media just are basically posting stories on what deals are where, so we yeah. figured it was a good week to take off. Yeah. Um, we'll be back on the 3rd of December, where we will be talking about Wreck-It Ralph 2, Ralph Wrecks the Internet, Ralph Breaks the Woo! Internet, Yeah. Um, which I'm really looking forward to, I really love the first one. Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah... For, for now I think that's us signing off be sure to follow us on all the social media check us out on SoundCloud like share etc yeah share if you've enjoyed let us know if you've enjoyed and until don't next us. don't at me about Bojack Horseman it's great or <laughs> at me agreeing with me just don't at me disagreeing you know <laughs> or at me disagreeing I don't care um, <laughs> but yeah until the next episode I have been Phil. And I've been Nick. Thank you very much for joining us for a bit of a longer episode, but I think we've made it, I hope we've made it worth your while, so see you next time. Expelliarmus. Avada Kedavra. Bye.